Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter Gay Stories Podcast. I am your host, Kyle Ashworth, and you are at the intersection of sexuality and religion, where it meets at LGBTQ Avenue and LDS Street. Thank you for giving us an hour of your time, and thank you for helping us share uh, these stories to help us build bigger and stronger bridges between the LDS and LGBTQ communities and uh, also to our uh, wider religious audience as well. As we've uh, gained popularity on YouTube, we've been able to uh, kind of amass a religious following that that um, isn't typically Mormon. So evangelical Christians, uh, Orthodox Christians, uh, those that come from high demand religions where religious uh, spaces haven't really given an opportunity for queer voices to be heard, um, have migrated uh, into our channel. So we welcome you and welcome a variety of listeners and uh, watchers of these Latter-Gay Stories podcast episodes. Super excited for today's episode because it um, it really will kind of hit all of those senses when we talk about the uh, the Mormon experience uh, and the experience that surrounds uh, the demands of religion. We want to welcome to the podcast Joel Jacks uh, from Las Vegas. Las Vegas. The big city of... <laughs> Um, to the podcast, kind of a wide variety of things we're going to talk about. Uh, we want to talk about uh, your story serving as a, a young Latter-day Saint missionary, um, determining, um, realizing who and what he is. Uh, we're going to talk about conversion therapy. Uh, we're going to talk about um, mixed orientation marriages. Uh, we want to talk about uh, leaders in the church who laid their hands upon your head and then prayed the gay away. Uh, we want to talk about what life is like um, navigating this world, uh, some mission experiences that kind of led to uh, your future um, beliefs and, and how you navigated uh, this journey. We also want to talk about um, those religious influences and how they cemented and or even gave barrier and barricade to your ability to move forward and your ability to um, make the necessary steps to be happy and healthy and, and vibrant. We also want to talk about where you're at today. So a lot to talk about. Um, for all those things that I didn't highlight and cover, <laughs> I want to give you the opportunity to give us a, a little introduction about who, before we jump into your complete story, um, who's Joel? And tell us a little bit more about you. So um, I think I always start off with, I'm a father of two, um, two great kids, even though they're teenagers. Um, I'm, I'm proud of that accomplishment through, through everything, you know, I've been able to be a dad and, and have two great kids in my life. Um, older guy, <laughs> I'll turn 50 this year. Um, grew up LDS in the, in the, in the church. Um, I, I need to needle point on my pillow. You know, there was never a rule. I didn't not follow right and I didn't break any rules I was I was the perfect kid out of six um, I I work now in technology I'm a, an evangelist so when we're done here I'll tell you about my evangelism we can, I think I have one of those uh, um, baptismal fonts that that uh, John talks about in the back of my my Volkswagen will dunk you real quick and then you'll you'll be good to go in my career. Well, that's amazing. I, I, I thought it was funny in your introduction that you said uh, you are the straightest gay man that you know. <laughs> yeah, my, my ex has accused me of that a few times. And uh, one of my friends, um, actually, he's kind of the impetus why I'm here. He's he's super straight. And he pulled me aside a few weeks ago and said, hey, you know, I didn't really care about the whole gay issue. He said, until you came out, he says, and now I look at it, I realize if, if Joel's gay, then that's got to be cool. But yeah, I work on cars. I, I restored a Jeep, I, but I don't watch sports. So I, I think that might be the thing that tips me over into the <laughs> gay world. It's, I think one of the, the beauties of the podcast and allowing people to share their stories is that um, this realization that there is no singular uh, way to gay there's just no one way to gay. And so I do like the variety of stories. And, and even though that's a little bit tongue in cheek to say you're the straightest gay guy, um, it, it just kind of helps validate the experiences of people who may resonate or feel like you. Well, and that's important, I think, for people to realize that there's different, you know, there's different folks along the spectrum. Just as I met a guy that set off my gaydar and he seems extremely happily married the last 40 years. And, you know, <laughs> you know, he's the gayest straight guy I've ever met. 
you know, we, we all fall on a spectrum and in the world where we try to put labels on things, I think it's important for us to understand that maybe, yes, there's labels that can quickly identify what we do, but we just don't need to necessarily fit into a cookie cutter mold in order to fit in. Yeah, that's really well said. And I think it's a great place to begin uh, you sharing and telling of your story, because for many of us, when you talk about labels and talk about better understanding who and what we are, we don't have language to describe those very things. And so I often ask, at what point do you realize, not that you were gay, but at what point do you realize I'm different? So I think I realized that pretty young. I was a, I was a pathological liar <laughs> as a kid. And I think it was a shield I was putting up, right? I was making up fantastical stories and things that I would do, you know, to, to try to get people's vision off of looking at me, right? I didn't want the attention. And I'm still like that today, you know, come my birthday, I don't want anybody making a big deal, but I don't want attention on me, except for when I want attention on me and my job. But other than that, you know, let's, let's isolate that out. And um, so I think I knew from, you know, my brothers and sisters will tell you, I had a harem of girls, you know, I've best friends with girls all, all growing up. And uh, I think I knew then I was, I was, you know, not to put a label on it, but I couldn't put a label on. I didn't know what label to even put on it because I think at the, in the back of my mind, I knew what I felt wasn't in accordance to what should be done. So why, why even think about, I can, I can fix it. I can get better. Let's talk about your, uh, your household growing up, the, the kind of the family that you grew up under. Clearly you were raised Latter-day Saint, but let's talk a little bit about your, where, where were you raised and what was family life like sure. at the Jack's home? So my dad was a doctor, family doctor. Um, he moved up to moved from California, Southern California to Utah to raise his family, right? He didn't want to raise them in California. Um, my mom, you know, had had three kids, but was diagnosed with uh, multiple sclerosis at a young age. So she was only supposed to have the one kid. She ignored the doctors and had five more. So I sit as number four of, of six. Um, my rule following comes from my dad. He's a very black and white person. He grew up in a alcoholic family. And uh, when he found the church, he, he gravitated towards it. It gave him the structure that he was looking for. It gave him what he wanted in life. And, you know, my mom, her, her parents were alcoholic too, but they've been converted over to Mormonism. So, you know, I think she pretty much grew up in, in the church too. But her being in a wheelchair, I think, afforded us a, a level of spirituality that I don't know if we, we, we should have had. <laughs> she was very spiritual. She, I mean, up until the day she died a few months ago, she only watched and listened to conference talks and, and, and things of the church, you know. And like I said, we grew up w with one TV in the house and we got to watch the two PBS stations. My friends were watching Cosby Show and all these other things I, I, couldn't, I had no idea of because that's just how she she structured us so i grew up in a very religious you know very centered home like that would you call it orthodox um or were there liberal aspects to your life or was it very conservative christian that's a good question and i, and I think i don't think there was any liberal i think it was extremely orthodox you know it was our neighbors across the street got a divorce, and my mom said, I know exactly why. I saw them buying Diet Coke once. And if they can't keep the small rules, then how do you keep the big rules? And, you know, I was when I first had my first Coke when I was 22, <laughs> I, was, I was petrified. I didn't know what to do, you know, and then, wow, it tastes good. But Did you ever tell your mom that you bought a Diet Coke or a, a Coke? You know, yeah, there's a lot of stuff my mom didn't know before she passed. But, um, no, she... She knew I drank ice, drank iced tea at the end, but when she first saw, I have one tattoo on my arm. When she first saw that, and I didn't mean for her to see, I was working on their yard. I was what thirty three years old. I mean, talk about lecture and and, and that as a, as a as a married man at that time. She just she was never short on lectures. So very, and my dad, like I said, there, it was black and white. There was no gray area in the church. You either did it or you didn't do it. 
I think you've bundled that really well, helping us to understand kind of what life was like and how difficult it is for, for so many of us in this very situation who grew up in a, a super orthodox or very conservative religious household, not having language to describe who and what we are. And, and for in a very real sense, um, we know we're different without language to articulate what that difference is. You just kind of go about your merry life trying to do all the right things. Absolutely. And you know that wickedness never was happiness. At least that's what my mom would say. So I would never do things that would intentionally break the rules, right? I figured as long as I kept every rule, then then God had to follow his promises with me. God had to, you know, he had to live up to his end of the bargain. And uh, so I think that was not only drilled into me, but something that, you know, I still struggle <laughs> with today. Well, that rule following um, ended up leading you uh, on a mission. Yes. That's typical of what a Latter-day Saint um, of your age and your uh, classification does. You, at the age when you served, it was 19, 19 Yep. Uh, served a mission. And where did you serve? Uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Excited about serving in Minneapolis? Um, no. <laughs> My friend had just gotten called to London, England. And I filled out, and I, I saw his missionary application, so I filled mine out exactly the way he did, because that's where I wanted to go. I, wanted, I didn't want to go foreign speaking, but I wanted to go to, you know, an English speaking foreign mission. And for those who are unf unfamiliar with the way the mission process works, uh, a prospective missionary fills out an application and turns that into their ecclesiastical leaders. And then the church decides where you serve uh, your mission. Um, as senior couples, which are older missionaries, uh, typically husband and wife, married couple who serves, they are able to um, kind of jot down a few suggested areas where they might want to serve. But for the younger missionaries, today the age is 18 for uh, young men and 19 for young women. They don't get to choose, and they are just assigned an area. So you are assigned to serve um, your mission in Minneapolis, Minnesota, mm -hmm. uh, which is home to my husband. So it can't be all bad. It can't be terrible. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I know we've got great listeners that are in Minnesota because I hear from you. So uh, we, we can't completely um, harp on Minnesota, but it, it also isn't kind of, it's not the foreign land that a lot of missionaries aspire to, to serve in. Yeah. And I think that was a huge disappointment to me because again, I had done absolutely everything up to that point. I prayed for this. I really wanted, you know, I wanted to go I, I would have spoken a foreign language if I needed to, but to go to Minneapolis and, you know, with the two seasons, you know, your, your husband will tell you that's winter and road repair. Yeah. Exactly. Winter and, and melting winter. That's, yeah, melting winter. those are the two seasons. Especially this year. Yeah. But, you know, to, to feel like, okay, this is whatever, you know, I kind of just felt like, all right, I'll do it. You know, I'll go and do what, you know, what I've been asked to do, but. But having worked later in the church, I could real I did realize that there's not a lot of inspiration on that. You know, the things kind of get sorted out where they where they want. But I thought, well, at that time, I thought, well, if this is where I'm supposed to go. Then, then this is where I'll be. So, talk about um, your mission experience generally. Uh, were you an effective missionary when, oh, no. in terms of uh, and when we, when we talk about effective missionaries, that's often clouded in this language of multiple baptisms and uh, leadership positions and all the things that church members love to kind of fawn over as these new missionaries come home and, and list all of their accomplishments. So I think I struggled from, I know I struggled from day one. I was not, I mean, I wasn't a bad missionary where I was breaking rules because I didn't break rules. <laughs> I followed the rules, but I didn't want to tract because I didn't, I figured if they want to know, they'll, they'll search for us, right? They're, you know, if any of you lack wisdom, let them ask of God, let them ask of us, and then we'll come to them. So I didn't like to tract, you know, we got referrals from time to time. But if, if somebody said, you know, I don't believe, or I don't feel like this is what I want, then I would be like, all right, you know, it's your choice. I didn't do the hard sell. I've never been <laughs> that person. So I think I struggle from day one. And I think I also struggle too, because I knew that there's something different in me. Again, I still didn't have a label for it. I didn't know I was gay. I didn't, I mean, I knew, but I didn't have a word for it. And I felt like, hey, I'm doing everything the Lord wants. Why am I not getting this, right? Why am I seeing others who are watch, watching TV on their mission 
having baptisms? Why am I watching others who are, you know, doing X, Y, Z, not following all the rules? So I felt like I had to follow the rules even harder. And it just, it caused a lot of anxiety. I, I think, you know, I, I feel bad for some of my companions, <laughs> or most of them that had to serve with me just because I probably wasn't the best. I just was always just trying to be the top, the best. And it's not, it's not healthy. And that's what led to me coming home at, after, at about a year out. So you, you left your mission early. Mm-hmm. Um, w- was the mission designed or prepared to help you in your time of need in, in that dissonance that you were f- feeling? Um, I, don't, I don't really think so. I come to find out later, after, a couple of years after I'd gotten home, that my mission president had called my family and my parents and said, I think your son is gay. Mm. But he didn't tell me that, you know, and I, before uh, the month before I left, I was seeing a psychologist, a church psychologist that was never brought up. You know, it was more of, you know, wh- how do you feel? And it, it was there was never anything that was mentioned about that. Um, if somebody had told me that, then I've been like, apps, you know, I that makes sense. This is not the place for me. I need to go home and, and stay home. So, um Typically in a mission, when an elder or a sister, a male or female, serves in the mission field, uh, they're overseen by uh, what's called the mission president, which is basically your mission leader. And that mission president has multiple interviews, has um, a fairly decent amount of contact, but also Latter-day Saint missionaries are given a wide berth, uh, this full autonomy, really. You essentially live with your companion for two years. And aside from some mission interviews and opportunities for some conferences, you really don't have much interaction with a mission president. No. And so I'm curious how maybe even you're, you've had a few decades to figure out um, this, or nearly 20 years to um, kind of wonder, but how, how do you think your mission president came to that conclusion that you were gay, Had you given that you hadn't had any conversations with him? So as you know, mission presidents usually serve for three years, and right when I left was the end of his three years. So you know, what, what percentage of the population is gay? You know, he, ha- he I felt like he'd had gay missionaries before. And, and that's, he, he's, again, I, I don't, I don't think I have the mannerisms or come across as gay, but I think he saw the struggle equal to what some of his other missionaries had gone through. And I think that's what he was able to I mean, he's, he's a good man and and truly loved, you know, loved us, you know, but I just don't think he was, he he taught institute, so, you know, church institute at the college level for his whole career. I don't think he was prepared to be able to handle the the intensity of the the missionaries that were going to come out. And this is the early 90s too, right? Um, I mean, they kind of cracked down after that, but they sent everybody out on a mission. I mean... <laughs> one of my companions was meeting up with his girlfriend and they shot their, you know, engagement pictures out on the mission. And, uh, you know, she was from Idaho and here we are in Minnesota taking those pictures. It just, you know, and that was hard for me because I'm like, why, why does my heavenly father love him so much more than me? What is so wrong with me that he's able to be a good missionary, right? Everybody loved him. Everybody looked up to him. Everybody wanted to be him. And here I am, just this slovenly, you know, whatever I am, piece of garbage that my Heavenly Father can't even see to, you know, take this burden off of my shoulders. Gosh, it's terrible that we're even in a position where we have to use those descriptors against ourselves, that religion puts those kind of in our vernacular and allows us to stew over something like that. But it's in the, it's in the scriptures, right? It's it, You're taught that in the scriptures, those who don't aren't of God's, you know, chosen or, or what, you know, dross to be tossed under your feet, you know, it's trampled on lukewarm, you know, lukewarm spit out. Absolutely. I want to talk a little bit about that experience with your mission president and uh, discussing your sexuality with your parents. Um, did they speak to you about that? Uh, if so, uh, what was that conversation like? And and, no, and kind of how does that how does that set the scene for you coming home early as an early release missionary, and what trajectory does that? 
so want you to. Into. No, my, my parents didn't bring it up. They, they brought it up to me when I came out to them about eight years ago. And my mom mentioned it then. So here I was, you know, 20 years after my mission, she finally says, well, your mission president said you could be gay. <laughs> I'm like, well, how did that come up? You know? So, and the, the trajectory was a pretty tough one. So I came home early, but my, my dad, again, black and white, wouldn't even pick me up at the airport. Um, my state president had to pick me up. I stayed there a couple nights until they smoothed things out with my parents. And, you know, I did, I, I went through, I said, call it mini conversion therapy. You know, it was pretty intensive therapy at, at the church office buildings for a couple of weeks. I just want to reverse because I think that's a super important point for Latter-day Saint families to hear. Um, you come home early from your mission and your parents refuse to pick you up at the airport. So Kyle, I already feel like I should have a millstone hung about my neck and thrown into the depths of the ocean. Because, I haven't done anything, not, because not, not because I've done anything, but because I am as evil, according to the miracle forgiveness, which I had to read, <laughs> I'm, I'm no better than a, a murderer. And my parents believed it and didn't want me. And so I already feel low and I felt completely alone. I mean, I've been alone in my life, but I had had people around me from, you know, the state president's family, but I felt utterly and, and absolutely alone. The answer to the aloneness and the answer to the repair if we want to bring in the miracle of forgiveness was conversion therapy. Yep. Your idea, your parents' idea, your stake president's idea, whose idea was this to So the first the up? first one it was just, you know, the I think I think the church was trying to figure out, okay, we got these missionaries coming back that are gay. How do we fix them and send them back out? You know, and at that point I wasn't feeling depressed or anxious anymore. You know, they said, "Okay, we're going to reassign you out." And I got that sick feeling in my stomach again that said, "Don't do it." But course i listened to everybody else's spirituality and not my own and allowed myself to go back out again let's talk about that conversion therapy experience mm -hmm. um what do you what do you want to share or what can you share about that experience what what was the curriculum um where did it take place who who might have been involved what were they what was the goal um of the therapist on your behalf so i think the goal of the therapist was to help me bury the feelings that I was feeling, right? It wasn't to address them. It wasn't to bring them up again. Nobody had mentioned that, you know, they thought I was gay. Even through all that therapy, it was, okay, you need to read these scriptures. This is what you need to read. Read Miracle Forgiveness. Annotate it. Bring it back. I mean, I can quote verse out of <laughs> the Miracle Forgiveness because of how deeply we had to study that, go through that. And, you know, Ezra Tap Benson was a prophet, so this is just two prophets before you know, that had passed. So it was still quote unquote relevant at that time. And we're talking timeline wise, the very early nineties, 1990, yep. 91 ish, uh, 90, yeah, 91, 92 ish. Yeah. So uh, that was the curriculum, right? Read that, study that. And the, th the three things that kept getting pounded out of my brain was, okay, if you do these three things, read your scriptures, pray, serve in the church that, you know, then you'll, you'll be taken. But it, the onus was on me, right? The whole burden of everything was on me, even though I hadn't done anything wrong, even though that I hadn't made this choice, the whole burden was on me. And there was, and if it wasn't working, it was on my shoulders. If it was working, well, then they did their job. I'd love to build a business on that. <laughs> it's a great model. I, we could call it the corporation of the presiding. Never mind. The how much time did you spend in the conversion therapy program? So it was about three hours a day, uh, six days or five days a week at the church office buildings. So it wasn't even at the family services. It, that was kind of one of the weird things about that too. It was actually in the church office buildings. In fact, I remember <laughs> waiting in the waiting room sometimes for my appointment and hearing other troubles of missionaries being relayed by the sisters that were, you know, the, the older sisters that were working there and some of the stories of missionaries throughout the world <laughs> that they were experiencing. And, you know, I think the church was going through a pretty tough time that, you know, with, again, giving a lot of autonomy to young adults that probably need a little bit more supervision than they were giving. So they, um, they determined at some point that you had either 
cured, um, set yourself on more of a solid foundation and had a conversation with you and invited you to serve again and, and go back out into the mission field. Yeah, I, 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 I truly think I was an experiment, right? Did this work? And it, did it, does it sit, right? They'd shown me a couple, you know, not naked pictures, but, you know, scantily clad pictures and said, how do you feel about it? And, you know, I pushed it away as quick as I could. I, oh, I don't want to see that. I don't want to, I don't want to deal with that. I just, I, I really do feel, as I look back, I was an experiment, right? How do, how do we fix this problem? Let's try what we, we know how to do and let's do it. Hello, Boston. <laughs> and then out to Boston, Massachusetts. Let's walk our listeners through that experience. So at any <coughs> point um, during that conversion therapy process, did you use the words, I'm gay? Um, was there an effective burying of that part of your identity and was that taken with you to Boston? I, I'm curious how that, no, where, where your mind is. It wasn't buried, it was swept under the rug, right? It wasn't very, it wasn't far away. The, the, the general feeling I get from that was, yes, you're different, but everybody's different, you know? But I'm like, I'm different in a different way, right? I know we're all different, we're, you know, we're all snowflakes, but and there's something different about me and they're like, no, you're just you're you're just too hard on yourself. And you know, I am a perfectionist. I I give them that. So it was them saying, you know, be a little bit more calm. But you know, there's a huge stigma if you come from one mission to another. You're already a problem missionary, right? And then I was in a was served in a you know on a companionship in a, in a in a threesome for the first few months, and it just. You know, I tried, I tried everything. And, you know, you talk about bloodying your knees. I remember nights I, and I, I had the, I had the suit pants for a while. I kept them um, that actually had the blood in the knees from me being on my, on them all night, just bargaining with the Lord, pleading with the Lord. Like you can do whatever you want with me, Lord, just take this away. Whatever this is, whatever this burden is, just take it away. No 19, 20 year old should have to make those bargains. But I mean, when, when you're told your whole life, here's the pattern to happiness, right? We draw this, you know, the plan of salvation and this plan of happiness out, you know, how do you get from here to here to here? It is by following and making sure these mileposts are in your life. And if you don't have that, what, what are you going to be left with? Well, you're going to be left with utter de devastation and, and, and hell. Was uh, was the conversion therapy, reparative therapy, therapy from the church effective? Did you did you survive the mission? No. <laughs> so um, one of the things I've always prided myself on is I've always said um, I believe that you know I have a heavenly Father that loves me. I believe I never said I know, and that's no, that's something that just rankles me to this day. I just went a few months ago to a, a ward thing with my kids and it would happen to be fast Sunday and little kids are up there saying, I know I'm like, you don't know. <laughs> you can't know. Nobody knows. Like you can believe unless you've seen it, unless you touch it, you can't know. So we did I was <laughs> joke about the force testimonies, you know, the force testimonies in front of a general authority and the general authority pulled me aside afterwards and said, you need to know. You need to tell people you know. And I said, that's just not the way I feel. And he's like, well, then you don't belong out here in a mission. And I'm like, you're probably right. A week later, during transfers, you know, the mission president calls me up and says, you know, let's like, you know, probably going to send you home. And he said, but we'll send you home honorably because you have done nothing wrong. And I did. I <laughs> followed the rules as best I could. I've done nothing wrong. So, you know, I... Th I think that was to placate me to, to, you know, so I didn't kick and scream on the way out, but that was it. And then, uh, you know, coming home, facing my home ward <laughs> that I'd lived in many years. I'm, I'm curious, uh, before you faced the ward, if your parents showed up at the airport this time. No. I can't blame my mom because she was in a wheelchair. But 
yeah, I disappointed by my dad. And I really think that that was the biggest thing above it all is I didn't want to disappoint my dad. And I did. And that was a hard thing for me to come over, you know, as to, to get over to is understanding that I have a heavenly father that's not like my dad at all. Very conditional love, right? My dad, if you did X, Y, Z, I love you. If you don't, then you don't have that. And I just, the way he was raised, I can't, I can't fault him for that. He, he did good things in other ways, but I don't, I think he knew in the back of his mind I was gay. And then knowing, hearing that from a mission president, he just didn't want anything to do with me. He didn't know how to handle me. How do you, how do you handle yourself? How you clearly that experience alone is enough to devastate your soul. Um, what do you do with that? You're fr- I mean, you're 20 years old. You're home from your mission. Yep. You Tw- attempt, 21 years old. You attempt suicide. To this day, I don't know how I got to the emergency room at St. Luke's Hospital in Salt Lake. I have no idea. But I'd moved out within a few weeks of being home. I was clear I was not welcome there. Um, I had a gay experience with a, I think more of a predator than, than anything else. I was just looking for a room to rent. And then I think this guy saw this 20 year old who was confused and, you know, and it's not what I wanted. And the sad thing is because my dad was a doctor, he knew about it. It was in the same, um, network that he worked in. Never got a phone call. I was estranged from my parents for eight years after my mission. And that's how I dealt with it because, you know, growing up with him being this big figurehead in the community, uh, we were always told, don't screw up the Jack's name, right? It's better you change your name than, than let them know that you're a Jack's. And I'd screwed it up. I screwed up the name. I did just, I deserved a son of perdition letter from <laughs> some Sunday school kids. It was just, I was evil. And so the only way to get through that was to put that expectation of who I was away but to bury myself back in the closet, you know, so far in the closet that I, I didn't even see Narnia. I was so beyond Narnia. I was in the, you know, one of the other lands because I just, I didn't want to be gay. I didn't want that. I, but I didn't want the, the pain of being gay too, that I associated with being gay. Sure. I do want to back up because uh, if you had a gay experience or taken advantage of it by someone then there had to have been a point from mission to that experience where you started making some making some realizations. And I, I would love for the audience to kind of get a better understanding as to what happened, what the genesis of that experience. So I got home. Um, my, my dad let, me, let it known that, he, you know, I got a job pretty quickly with a, with a bank and making some pretty decent money and going to school. Um, as long as, by the way, as long as I went to school, my parents offered to pay for, you know, pay for it as long as the grades are good. And uh, I've got a master's degree and I haven't seen it a dime, but that's okay. I, I'm over that now. Um, but so I, in the process of looking, I found this older gentleman, he was he probably in his mid sixties, who was renting out a room. And he, I think he sensed it in me and sensed this darkness and became my, my friend. My, and, you know, it was nothing more than touching that we did in, you know, in, in his room, but it, it just didn't. F- so that, that bridging the gap, I think in my mind, I rationalized it saying, I just need love. I need to feel love from a man, you know, from a father figure, right? Somebody who, because that's kind of one of the things that, that conversion therapy kept saying, well, your dad is a distant person. You know, you, 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 you build these relationships with men, these on, unexp- you know, and un- uh, unexpectedly, um, just too high, right? I have these these high expectations. These high expectations. Thank you. And that was that was it, right? So I'm like, okay, so I'm not gay. I just have I just need to have you know. And this guy just took it way too far too quick. So uh, you let, let's just keep walking this this timeline uh, mm-hmm. of of the, leaving the family home, finding your own space. And now walking on your own. Yeah, so I'd always wanted to be a veterinarian. So I, I pivoted. Uh, I've been a veterinary technician for many years as a, you know, as a teenager. Um, so I started pursuing that again. I thought, okay, that's that's going to make me happy. 
And uh, so, went to, you know, after I got kicked out, I tried to finish up at the university up, you know, Westminster College, and then just ended up in Southern Utah University working for a veterinarian down there for about a year. And then my sister called me, uh, who's been my my guardian angel through all this, this the, the person I love more than life itself. My sister called me, and they were, she said, we're opening a store. They they were selling keychains and stuff in, in Las Vegas. And, you know, we need somebody to manage it. Would you do that? And this is a sister. I, I mean, she told me, I need you to jump on a bed of glass. I, I wouldn't hesitate. I would just do it because she's that good. And so, but in the meantime, I just pushed the gay way, right? I just didn't deal with it. Every time I had those feelings or those thoughts, I just pushed it away. I remember getting a... Uh, Mail pack. I don't know if you ever saw mail pack. It was men's underwear, you know, scant, scantily clad men's underwear. I don't know how I got it in the mail, but I remember getting that and just burning it. I'm like, you know what? That's not me. That's not who I want to be. And just pushing it as far away as I could. What was your activity level in the church at that point? Were you, you said you felt like you were pushing yourself back into the closet. Typically for people who sit in that chair and t- tell their <laughs> stories, it's that you become even more entrenched in the church. Oh, absolutely. And then you start following those mantras that if, back to the miracle of forgiveness discussion, um, bloody knuckles, bloody knees, try until there's no more try left, um, and then try just a little bit more because that is what Mormonism teaches. Yeah, if you look at my resume, at my church service resume, I mean, I've had some pretty high calling state clerk for many years executive secretary i i you know one of the stakes in in vegas you know i was a uh, early morning seminary teacher i was state clerk um sunday school teacher and i had another calling to i mean it was just give me more right just pile it on me i we moved up you know from las vegas i you know i met my wife my ex-wife in in vegas we moved up here in 2007 so i could work for the church and i threw my everything into that too i just I felt like, again, church service, right? That that the th- on the three legged stool, you know, if I could make that one leg really strong. I, but I was reading my scriptures too. I, I <laughs> you know, even before my mission, I I could Bible bash with the best of them because I mean that's what you grow up listening to and, and knowing. So, I think an important part of the story um, is that, and you kind of gave us a teaser that you did get married and yeah. you married a woman. Um, I want to talk about what happened prior to you marrying a woman um, at the church office building with a general authority. And you smile because um, I, I've talked a lot about this lately, about how the church um, uses its powers of authority, uh, particularly its priesthood powers, to help uh, people like you and I um, no longer, air quote, struggle with our same-sex attraction. And you have a story that's familiar. And and I laugh, Kyle, because it's not it's not an untold story today. Um, being down in Vegas, I, I help run the the uh, uh, affirmation Facebook page there, and somebody reached out to me who's twenty two, and they had the same experience with the same general authority I had. Thankfully, they listened to their own spiritual compass and. But so mine was, is, yeah, I, I dated girls before, um, was engaged twice, but they, they broke off. And I met Kelly. And if I was going to be married to any one woman in the whole world, it would be Kelly. You know, she, she's, even to this day, is phenomenal. She's, you know, still a good friend. It, I, it breaks my heart that we're not best friends, but, you know, we're good friends. And we were engaged. And, again, serving in a, in a state clerk, I went to my state president and said, I don't know if I can do this. And we had a visiting general authority come down. He's like, well, why don't you meet with him? And I did, and I laid my heart out. And he's like, well, do you want to be gay? I'm like, no. (laughs) You know, have you done it? You know, like I'd had, you know, a few, my few experiences, because they were fleeting, they weren't, for me, I need a relationship. I need that, that, that connection. I just, I'm not one of the guys who can, you know, have a one night stand. It's just never been me. It'll never be me. Um, I convinced myself with with my <laughs> cheap bachelor's degree in psychology that I just I wasn't that. So he 
we prayed the gateway. He laid his hands on my head for about three hours and said, again, gave me that th the three legs, you know, to stand on. Church service, read your scriptures, and pray, and it'll go away, you know, and get married. So maybe they had a, that other leg, right? As long as you get married, you know, you, you know, the Lord will bless you. What other specifics do you remember from that blessing and from that counsel from a general authority? Um, that there was only one way to happiness, right? That the, the, it's straight as the eight gate and narrow as the way. And you just, you, there's only one way you can get back to our Heavenly Father, and that is through, through marriage. He says, you know, do you want to live your whole eternity, you know, in, in outer darkness or, you know, the, the telestial kingdom, when you can have, you know, you can have this. Endure, right? Endure through the end. That Endure to the end. You know, that was something that was brought up a lot, too. And, you know, at the end, yeah, I was white-knuckling it. I mean, I, I don't know if I could have endured anymore, but, you know, I I truly believe I gave everything I could. And, and I think that that's one of the things that's helped our my relationship with my ex-wife is that she understood that, too, that I, it wasn't just a passing thing. And I'm like, I just gave up. It was... It was hell. And I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I think it's important for people who find themselves in these situations to analyze this from all the aspects. You, um, especially for all in Latter-day Saints, these Mormons who completely um, entrench themselves in the gospel, do that because they believe it. They do that because they believe their leaders are giving them good counsel. They believe the scriptures to be true. They believe the promises um, to be worthwhile. They understand the scriptures to be beneficial. They see the power of priesthood as being revolutionary and life-changing and life-giving. So when people say, Joel, you knew that you were gay, but you still went ahead and married a woman, how do you respond to something like that? How do you respond to that in a, in a, in a way that's, that's thrown at you as an ac accusation. Oh, and it's been thrown at me, you know, serving in the, the callings I have. I've gotten some pretty nasty feedback about, about that. And, and the, the thing is, is again, I, I, I placate myself by thinking I told, you know, I told my future wife beforehand that I'd had these experiences, but I truly felt like I had overcome them. I pushed them back. I was doing absolutely everything that I was told to do, and then some, right? Doing above and beyond what I saw other people who weren't having the struggles and who weren't going through what I was going through were being successful at. So I did it under the assumption that people better, you know, more spiritually attuned than me knew what they were talking about. And they had my best interest at heart. And I think to an extent they did, but I really think they had the image of what the ch they think the church should have been at heart. Yeah, and I think I think that's a really great way of explaining that because I I think you really have to understand two things. You in order in order for this to make sense, you have to understand the way Mormonism works, uh, which is very intricate, um, very spiritually based, very patriarchal. Um, very authoritative, um, systematic, yep. procedural. Um, so you have to understand that aspect of the way of the way Mormonism works. Mormonism is a lot like your dad, or your dad is a lot like Mormonism. Absolutely, this black and white uh, rigidity, no rainbow, no color, no gray. Yep. Um, it is all in or all out in a very real. And and I know you can argue with me. There'll be plenty of people who who will say, but that's not the Mormonism I. No, and my counter is always that's the Mormonism that you believe and hope exists, uh, especially in progressive um, spaces uh, with progressive Latter-day Saints. But the way the doctrine and the way the policy um, has been created and administered, it is very black and white. Yep. So that's one aspect of this that you have to know. The second aspect of this is you have to know what it's like to be gay because you have to be gay. You have to be queer in order to fully understand this experience. And most of our church leaders, the overwhelming majority of Mormon leaders, lack that second part. 
lack that true ability and true empathy to understand what their their queer congregants are going through. So they administer from a position of perceived hope, of trial and error that we discussed earlier in this episode, of just throwing some pasta and seeing what sticks. And that really is how Mormonism kind of dictates its administration, yep. is by trial and error, milk before meat. Um, if we can get a handful of Joels um, to be reclaimed or uh, refurbished and send them back out into the world, then we're a success. We saw that God blessed our efforts, and um, we'll just replicate that over and over again. But then you can justify when Joel doesn't succeed, well, Joel just didn't try hard enough. Perfect example. And, and Mormonism is replete with those examples where, um, yes, our patriarchal blessings, for example, all of these promises will come true predicated upon your uh, ability to live the gospel and to be righteous and to fulfill the measure of your creation. My patriarchal blessing does say I'll have a great respect for womanhood. And what better respect for womanhood than never want to lay a hand on them again? Sorry, that's a bad joke. Hey, but I, it does say that in there. <laughs> I like it. And, and you bring up a second point. We could do a whole other separate podcast episode about this, but how that culture of protecting women, this, uh, this ability for young men to, to, what is the best, how, how should I best and politically and socially explain this principle within Mormonism? But there, there is this, um, this culture within Mormonism that wants to protect women and the sanctity and chastity of women so much that gay men feel like they stay in the closet and don't understand their sexuality by mistranslating that protection of women and that sanctity of womanhood with their actual orientation. They say, well, I love women so much and I, I reverence women so much that um, I don't feel an attraction to them because I don't want to lust after them. I don't, I'm trying to obey and honor the law of chastity that's been taught to me. When in reality, they're a fish and you're a bird. You're two yeah. totally different species in a very metaphorical sense. Couldn't have said it better. Yeah, so all of those things. That was a long way around, not even a question that I had, but just kind of an, uh, an analytical look into what someone like you and I, who both experienced mixed orientation marriages, tackle. We are faced with the impossible, and we really rely on our church leaders to give us sound counsel, and that counsel is serve a mission, get married in the temple, have children, and this all goes away. It does. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. But it didn't go away. No. It's not supposed to go away. And this is where my guilt comes from, is I knew that. I think in the back of my mind, I knew it because I'd had a, you know, I just felt strongly that this wasn't right. But again, I put my spirituality in, on somebody else. I let them tell me what was good for me and what was right. So, all right, I'll, I'll do what you say rather than what I knew was right. And that's, I think that's guilt I'm just going to have to deal with the rest of my life because I'm better than that. I'm better than that because I never said I know <laughs> the church is true. Uh, and I, I would always say I believe that Jesus is the Christ. And I, I knew better then. Why didn't I know better at that at that point? But that's such a huge thing, your eternal salvation as well, right? That's pretty huge to, to, want, to not want to at least try. There had to have been, and, and I'm maybe just projecting my own experience, but um, you get married, there's that honeymoon stage where everything seems perfect, and there are goals to look forward to, and there are opportunities to move forward um, in, in this new relationship, until there's not, or until they don't. And so th that's often the familiar path that we we find, and and this realization normally happens in uh, what I like to call quiet isolation, in the darkness of our own soul, in the fortress that we've built around ourselves, this wall that we've created for the world to see, this facade. All of that happens on the inside, and very little of it happens on the outside. Well, it has to happen on the inside. 
because if I were to admit that there was a fault or there was a crack or there's just, it's not working, then whose fault is it? It's I'm not reading enough. I'm not praying enough. I'm not reading my scriptures enough. I didn't get married enough. Whatever it is, I didn't do enough. So of course it's got to be internalized. You can't, you don't want to broadcast that out that you're a failure because that's what you're doing is broadcasting that you're a failure. When you bring, that's a really great point too, because you, what you're doing in the, in the relationship is trying to build a happy, healthy relationship with your wife. And most people who are closeted gay men who marry, and, and this is the same uh, principle that's true with closeted women who marry men, um, who are men who are straight, women who are not straight. You don't want to tarnish the marriage. No. You don't want to make difficult a situation that could become toxic in the relationship if it's all going to go away. If the promises that your church leader gave you are true, then why bring this up and tarnish the marriage? So it is hidden and it does stay buried. Well, tarnish the marriage, tarnish the family. And, you know, I married into Vegas Mormon royalty. I mean, we've always joked that if Kelly's mom were to speak in one in one stake center and the prophet were to speak in another people would have a really hard decision to make between, okay, which one do we go to listen to? So you don't want to, you know, besmirch their family. You don't want to bring their name down because they're a good family. You know, they, they love each other and, and they don't deserve this. Right. Or my own family. I'm not as worried about their, their the Jack's name, <laughs> you know, because of what I went through with them. But so you have, you have all this, this weight on you that you, you, like you said, it's, it's not even quiet isolation. It's desperate isolation that you're just, you're, it's, it's a well that's just filling up with water and you, you, you can't tread it long enough. Did you have or ever fail, feel like you had resources to help you navigate that in or out of the church? So I did have, um, like I said, we, about, I'd say about six years before we divorced, we kind of had this thing happened in our, in our marriage that I had to basically come out again and say, okay, look, you can't blame yourself. This is, this is me. This is, this is what I'm doing. And, uh, the Bishop sent us to LDS family services. And again, I didn't want to be gay. So they're like, so that, that, you know, 10 years ago was, well, you're not really attracted to men. You're attracted to the male physique. You know, I'm, I, I didn't want to be with a man. I just wanted a man's body. You know, I wanted to have that man's body which we bought into We're like, okay, yeah, that that works. And we tried that for a couple more years and just realized it's, it's not gonna, it's not gonna happen. You, you tried that line of thinking or did you actually go on some physical fitness journey? <laughs> so I did a physical fitness journey. Yeah. I should show you the picture. I used to weigh about 450 pounds. Um, I don't look like the same person anymore, I think. Um, but, but there was just a lot there. I, I even went on a, uh, a gym type weekend, right? Just to, to, because they said, you know, I told them my relationship with my dad, oh yeah, you have a bad relationship with your dad. You need that strong male relationship. And, you know, talk about, I did not want a relationship with any of those guys there. It's just, they made my skin crawl. All right. We're backing up again because Uh-oh. you bring up another, these great topics. Um, Jim. Yep. Uh, Jim is Jim an type. Act- it wasn't Jim. Okay, so gym, a gym type yep. activity. Uh, gym adjacent. <laughs> gym adjacent. I've never heard that. So gym, um, in its typical form, uh, that is an acronym for journey into manhood. And this is an opportunity. Um, these are, are groups that are facilitated all over the country that are typically religious-based. Uh, or uh, These are opportunities for gay men to meet other gay men, but then also go through... Um, indoctrination mixed with psychology mixed with most of these facilitators have no background in therapy they have no background in psychology or psychotherapy but yet they're giving advice as if they are trained therapists who can ungay it's a very um nonchalant uh reparative or conversion therapy program typically um detailing two main messages an overbearing mother and a distant father as causes or reasons for your sexuality. And bing, 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 I have both. There was the answer. That would, absolutely. So gym events, um, did you go out into the woods? Kind of tell us what those gym adjacent events were like So I did one before I got married. 
and it was yeah it was out in the woods you met you know and you had a, a mentor that you you worked with um we went through a rebirthing event you know where you went through some pretty tight blankets you know you had to stand up there and say five things you hate about yourself and they would shout out things that they liked about you and I think it would have been probably more impactful if I, number one, knew any of the men and number two, respected any of them, you know, because most of them were talking about how they were just having relationships with, with other men and trying to get over it. I hadn't, I, you know, I, I was driving and that was what, you know, into my marriage too, that, that, that weekend, it, it was a, it was a hotel room. It wasn't into the woods. It was a, it was a hotel room and, or a conference room. And, and again, the, I couldn't relate because these guys, uh, most a majority of them were just, you know, out carousing with other men and wanted to carouse with, and uh, I'm, I, you know, I stayed true all the way through to, to the, you know, to the day we signed the divorce decree. And if you're thinking like, this story sounds bonkers, this journey into manhood sounds bonkers, because it is. It is, absolutely. It is absolutely bonkers. This is the strangest thing for reparative therapy that, either conservative Christians, Mormonism, the hopeful created and tried to invent. But this this is the reality of your husbands, your sons, your brothers who are navigating this world on their own, reaching out to religious circles for the best help possible. These are the places that they're going. Groups like Journey into Manhood. You say you talked about the one in the temple. I've been all over the internet talking. Of, or sorry, at the uh, church office building. No, 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 the conference center. I oh, was thinking yes. uh, we're just talking about hotel conference centers. Yes. But I've been all over the internet many times talking about uh, cuddle parties that have been initiated. <laughs> this is where they originate in yeah. groups like Jim, in groups where men who desire um, both physically and emotionally the connection with other men lead themselves to these different levels of cuddle, uh, these cuddle parties, where they can have um, same gendered experiences uh, with other men, but then go home and experience marriage with their wife. Which is nothing more in my mind than, you might as well just, you know, you're being unfaithful. At that 100%. Point. For me, that was, I, I experienced the exact same thoughts. How, how on earth could I justify, in my mind, that was not only physical but emotional cheating with my wife. How could I justify that um, by saying I need that connection so much that I'm willing to hurt the relationship of my wife? Absolutely. And I, I don't, how many did you have to experience before you felt that? I went to none. Okay. For good. the record, I, <laughs> I went to no cuddle parties. Um, I didn't I, go to cuddle parties, but. Yeah. And like, like you, I was absolutely. F um, there was complete fidelity in, in our relationship, in our marriage. I just needed, for me, my biggest obstacle was trying to find other people out there who were like me, who were, they were fathers, they were active Latter-day Saints. We were living the white picket Mormon fence life. I needed to figure out and find those people who were similar to me, and I needed to know how they were doing it. Right. And I think you and I, our stories are so similar because we found the same person who was doing this. Well, and, and it's funny you say that, you know, we were trying to find that one person who'd gone through it. And for me, when I, I was searching, right, I was searching LDS, gay, father, and on the, on the internet. And, um, you know, there's only been a few times I've worried about, you know, cleaning out the, uh, the internet cache. And that was one of the times, but I came across an article that had just come out a few weeks before about a, a man who was a therapist that says, Hey, I'm in a, you know, I'm in a straight monogamous relationship and here I am, you know, a gay man and it can be done. And I found his email. I wrote him a long email saying, you know what? I feel like I'm the same way. Give me the recipe, right? Tell me how to do it because I'm not doing it right now. And it's not feeling right. And never got a response back. And it's interesting that you bring that up. You're like asking me for asking for a recipe and for the, the audience. And I don't think this is a secret. Uh, you wrote a letter to Josh Weed and Josh Weed wrote an article. Um, his, his, he and his, his wife, Lolly, uh, Laurel at the time, um, as they were, when they were married, shared their experience about uh, a mixed orientation marriage. Joshua, who is a prolific and uh, kind of a beautiful writer, wrote this experience and uh, published it as a blog post, and it went viral. It not only went Mormon viral, but it went nationwide viral, how a gay Mormon man was making it 
work. And here was a poster child. In fact, it probably was one of Mormonism's first very public poster stories in this space. I read it and you read it. Yep. Um, my, my point though is that here you were asking Josh Weed for a recipe. Um, and this is an interesting dilemma that Latter-day Saints find themselves in where we revert to this law of Moses way of thinking. Like we, we want to be autonomous. We want to be able to live our own lives. We want to have personal revelation on our, on our own experiences. But when it comes to something that we're not able, able to control, and in your situation, you're asking for the law of Moses. You want Absolutely. the rigid line by line rules to teach you how to be a better father and husband and, and just survive, not, not, not even thrive. I just want to survive. Sure wasn't working the way I was doing it. So I had to try a different way. The way I was doing it, you know, I was white knuckling it through life, right? Barely hanging on. This, if somebody could give me a concrete way of, you know, that I could say, okay, I read my scriptures for 25 minutes today and, you know, I did an hour's worth of church service and I listened to this conference talk today, not as specific, but, you know, if, if, if this is what I need to do, I will do it because I truly, truly loved my wife. I, again, if, if she's the only person in this whole wide world, I know that. And I've traveled the world. <laughs> I travel a lot for work. She's the only person that I could have ever, a woman that I could have ever made it work with. And I knew that. And so I'm like, let's make it work. I wanted to make it work and she's pretty cool. So, you know, but, and that, that kind of leads to, to the other part of, of this whole recipe is. It wasn't working, and she saw that. She saw that we're we're struggling. Yeah, I don't want a hypothetical or or just wonder, but um, I kind of feel like there was some inspiration in the fact that Josh didn't respond back to you. That oh. your trajectory would have been completely different had he given you the law of Moses. And I and I say that only because, and I want you to answer, okay. but I, I bring that up only because I interviewed Josh and Lolly um, when they finally decided and announced to the world that they were divorcing on this podcast, episode 109, um, from their lips to God, basically a very open, honest conversation about writing the first blog post, writing the second blog post, how the church weaponized their story, how Latter-day Saints, in very much in your situation, Joel, wanted so much to have them counsel and give that law of Moses that it scared the weeds to death because they li very literally were having people cling to their words. And when their outcome wasn't the same, those words were being used against Josh and Lolly. It was a devastating experience for them. And, you know, and I hate to say I have a love hate relation. I've never met them. I, I have no idea. You know, I, I, I work here in Salt Lake from time to time. I probably ran into them and never even known it, but for somebody, and I see why he wrote it, because at that point in his life, he felt that, right? And he felt like he could make that happen. And there were points in my life, that's why I hung on like I did. But there also comes a point where you just realize, I mean, it probably would have extended maybe a year or two what we went through. But but at the end, you know, my health was declining. You know, my, uh, you know, she saw that and she's like, you're killing yourself you just got to stop. And I have so much respect for her that she came to me and said, look, cause I hadn't even read lollies or they're getting divorced. She brought it to me. I I've been traveling and she's, and there was something different when I got home and she gave it to me and it was, it was justice because I remember giving her the article from Josh saying, you need to read this. This is what I'm going through. And her, you know, that we were up all night with that. Well, when she gave me Lolly and Josh's, you know, divorce, it, we went, we were up all night with, with that too. But it just, I, I think the biggest thing through me, through, for me, all, through all that is that I, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. In the footnotes, it doesn't say, well, it's got to come through the prophet too, or through your church leaders. We can go directly to God and get our answers or the universe, whatever you want to call it. We can get those, those, those answers directly. We just have to listen for it. It's corporations that put limitations on that. And 
I mean, I knew before reading that article that it was, I wasn't doing the right thing. Um, the article made me kind of forget or not forget, but push, go push that back in the closet. Right. <laughs> and I, I don't blame anybody but myself. Right. It's, it's truly, I should have been strong enough in my own spirituality to, to do that. So yeah, I had to revert to the law of Moses because the, you know, the, the new law just wasn't, wasn't working. And the new law wasn't working, not because it doesn't work. It's because I was letting other people tell me what that law was. How do you tell someone that you love that it's time to give each of you an opportunity to love and be loved more completely? Well, I got off easy because, you know, she came to me and said, you know, I, we just can't do this anymore. And she was right. I couldn't do that to her anymore. I, I love and respect her so much. that, And she's married again to a great guy. She's happy. I'm happy that she's happy. I couldn't ask for it for anymore. She's an, a wonderful mother to, to my kids. We split custody every other week. You know, we live a mile away. I mean, it's almost like Josh and Lolly Weed. I think I, they have, have a ranch or something that they were looking at buying together. We're, we're not that close and, and we'll never be that close. But, you know, we're, we, we co-parent. And I realize how lucky and blessed I am that it wasn't forced, that it happened on her timeline and when she was ready for it. Because I see what, and you've, you've seen it too, with a lot of men that are in this position, that the vitriol, the hate, the anger that comes from all of that. I haven't had to, I mean, I've had to deal a little bit with it, which is to be expected, but and overall it's been a lot more positive, definitely, than, in fact, you know, I'll go to church, I went to church last Easter with, you know, this Easter, past Easter with the kids and stuff, and somebody said, you guys are like the closest, you know, I'm the straightest gay guy, but we're the closest divorced couple that they know. It, we just don't do things the, the people, the way people want them anymore. We do them what's right for us. I want to talk about the next world that uh, falls at your feet, and that is the one where you have to grow up from being a little baby gay, where you have to now experience, um, I, I would assume that being divorced and having this epiphany, this breakout, um, an opportunity to come out, then gives you an opportunity to begin exploring uh, your sexuality and better understanding who and what you are. Um, I'm very interested in how you navigated that world and, and how that process on. on <laughs> so she has, um, my ex has a, a cousin who's gay. Um, and he did make the mistake of taking me to a gay bar before we'd, we'd already agreed to separate, but we hadn't divorced finally. And that was kind of not good, but nothing happened other than I went to the gay bar. And I'm like, I, I realized with my previous experiences that this just isn't what I want. I don't want the, the temporary. I want to find somebody. So I've used the apps I've dated, you know, a couple months. I'm, I have a boyfriend now or seven months into, into this. Oh, seven, almost eight. <laughs> Better get that right. <laughs> but, you know, it's it's tough, right? Because there, I mean, we grew up in the church. There's dating manuals. There's how, how to date a girl and, and what to do. And like you said, how to respect them and stuff. There There is no manual on how to date a guy. And you've probably experienced the same thing. It's like, what, what do you do, right? How do you, how do you explore this new baby gay world? I didn't tint my hair. I didn't uh, go blonde. So oh, we, we save those for crisis modes. Okay. So, and where you don't have much, you're thinning on top. You may have to get a, a, a blonde a wig. toupee or something. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm just, I'm just fore foretelling what might happen <laughs> in the future. But you know, so again, I don't think I've gone through the normal you know, coming, I know a lot of guys go through the, you know, the horse stage, right, of sleep. But I knew that that's not what I want, right? I want that close relationship. I, For me, I need that. I think it's really honest as well, like, because um, this goes back to what we talked about in the beginning of the episode. There is more than one way to gay. And and you can look at the experiences of other people. And it's probably one of the biggest benefits to podcast episodes um, and a variety of podcast episode, episodes like this is to give people an opportunity to, to see the wide variety of stories that are out there. That not all of them have to be um, stories of whoredom 
Uh, they don't have to be stories of, of all the hookup apps. They don't have to be stories of um, extreme pain. And they also don't have to be stories of ultra-orthodoxy or even um, no church at all. I mean, there are so many different versions of this story that I'm always excited for every single one of them because they're all different. And that's the beauty of this, right? This is a kaleidoscope. Everybody has their own story. I can't say what is right for me is right for somebody else. When my son was four, we took him trick-or-treating, and he hated chocolate. And he goes to somebody's store, all they had is chocolate, he'd go to the next place. And people say, how can you hate chocolate? He just did. It just, just wasn't for him. You know, did it make him bad? Did it make him different? No, it's just we all have things that we, and that's, that's one of the things I always tell people is we all like different things. You know, we all do different things. Embrace that and, and enjoy that. Otherwise, you're living somebody else's life. And, you know, and I think that that's really one of the things I wanted to drive home today is the reason I chose to come out, the reason I chose to, to be what I was supposed to be is because at that judgment bar, if there is a judgment bar, I'm not going to be asked, did you do everything that the prophet said? Did you do everything that this guy said and this guy said? I'm going to be asked, did you do what I prompted you to do? Did you do what I asked you to do? And I can say I, at this point, yeah, I am doing everything that I know that I feel in my heart is, is right. And guess what? I'm happier than I've ever been. I'm not white knuckling it through life anymore. Well, except for when I drive through Provo Canyon in my car, but <laughs> we, we all did that. We're all guilty. <laughs> I don't think we can leave this part of the story without um, having a discussion about your parents. We opened the episode with the rigidity, the orthodox uh, nature of your family. I would love to uh, hear that experience of coming out to them. You said it was about eight years ago or so. Yeah, so when I came out to, to Kelly at that time, um, she's like, you need to talk to your parents about this. And they were living in St. George, Utah at the time, so hour and a half. Well, it's all, I'll, I'll be two-hour drive from Vegas. <laughs> and uh, I go up to their house, and, you know, when I tell them. But at that point, Kelly and I were still trying to keep it together so it it we we went in stages and they were okay with my dad said something at that point and you know that's when my mom told me my dad said something at a point he says well as long as you don't act on it you know and that's reminds me of Downey H. Oaks talk right you can be gay but you just can't be gay around me right we won't you know we won't let a boyfriend come home or, or things and don't be, put us in that situation don't yeah. don't we won't show you out. We won't take you out in public. We don't want you to be a lengthy house house guest. We just don't put us, especially if there's children in the home. Right. We don't want you to put us in that situation. But right before we divorced, Kelly went and talked to the, um, my dad had, had cancer at that point. So they were living in assisted living. And when, we, you know, four years, about four or five years later, you know, she went in and told them, he says, look, you know, this is the way it is and stuff like that. And, it's funny because before then I've been taking my dad to different appointments and things like that. And he probably the, the second most hurtful thing he's ever said is he said, my little brother's and my little brother's awesome. I love him to death. And he said, my little brother's name, I love the man you are not like your brothers. <laughs> I'm like, Oh my gosh. You know, at that point I was still, you know, executive secretary. I was doing everything I was supposed to do. And, and here he held my little brother, higher up than me, you know, he, he was on anesthesia or coming out of it. I, I give him that stuff, but I know that, you know, it's been a blessing for me that he did pass before I went through my baby gay, because I don't think you would accept it at all. You know, my mom recently passed too, and <clears throat> she briefly met my boyfriend before she did. And she had a hard time with that. So, yeah, that rigidity doesn't go away, and and I can definitely see, you know, I I tried to I I can see why the suicide rate is so high here because if you have a parent, the person that's supposed to love you the most in the world doesn't, and I think that that's helped me be a better dad. In my house, I have a sign that says Jack's family rule. There's only one rule, and it's I will always love you. That's it. I don't care what they do. I always love them. And that's how I have to look at Heavenly Father, right? 
he's not this guy trying to if you know if we screw up he's trying to smite you know there's there's got to be love how um how have your children managed this new world and this new part of dad that they didn't know before so my son is uber straight <laughs> um since a young kid, he's always wanted a girlfriend. Uh, he used to, when we lived up here in Salt Lake, he, he'd fall down in front of girls at classic skating, older girls, blonde hair, blue eyes, and he, he's a good skater, but he'd fall down just so they would pick him up and stuff. So I don't think he gets it, but he doesn't get, not get it either. He has, I've asked him a few times, how do you feel about it? And he's like, you know, whatever. But again, I think it becomes from both parents understanding that, you know, being gay isn't bad, it isn't evil. So, and my daughter, you know, asked me before I met John, when are you going to start dating, dad? When are we going to start meeting, you know, meeting your boyfriends? And, but I think we did it the right way. You know, we reached out to a counselor, a non-LDS counselor that said, okay, we're going to divorce. How do we tell them? How does, should Joel tell them he's, he's, you know, he's gay. We took some advice from Josh and Lolly Weed. And I read him that Stella, you know, the, the book and, and I think we don't make a big deal of it, so they don't make a big deal of it. That's a great way of putting it. And, and I think that also shows the value of co-parenting and being symbiotic in those um, opportunities to raise children, um, like-minded. And she likely has a whole different religious philosophy than you do, um, but it still shows that you can manage um, the gray area. Yep. And, and that you can create a space that, and I think, uh, I think maybe Josh and Lolly even coined this and we used it in our own experience, but, um, two families or one home, uh, two homes in one family. That's, and, and that was kind of the mantra that we kind of lived off of. We have two separate homes, but we're still a family yep. and there are still some important parts of mom and dad and the kids that are perpetual and they still exist in, in my relationship with my ex-wife today. And that's, I think you, you have to do that, right? I think your kids are healthier for that. And there's probably been some times where you've had to swallow things on your end and, and maybe not say things, maybe bite your tongue. And she's probably had to do the same thing on her end. But that maturity, that level of maturity and that acknowledgement that you guys aren't the only ones in the relationship anymore. I think your kids are probably way more healthy than, than they ever could have been. Yeah, I sure hope so. And I, I hope that's the goal. I want to wrap the last part of the podcast with some advice. Okay. What advice do you give church leaders, um, especially those who are still counseling? And we know this is happening even today, that there are apostles who are, are counseling um, queer members of the church to just find a good girl. Um, they're still laying their hands upon the heads of vulnerable gay Latter-day Saints, both male and female, saying, if you just try hard enough, if you live the fullest measure of your creation, you will find love. You will find all the things that you're searching for. You'll find a relationship that leads you through the temple, and you'll have children. What is your advice to church leaders who seem an outdated and out of touch? So we need to insert that clip of Bob Newhart yelling, stop it, because <laughs> they really need to stop it. There, it is not benefiting. It is not helping. It doesn't work, right? It's, <laughs> it's antiquated thinking. It's, it's ruining lives. Right? I know, I know for my ex, the 18 years we were married, I, you know, wasn't good. Wasn't all bad either. We, we went a lot of places. We did a lot of stuff together, but what if she could have spent those 18 years with somebody who really, you know, loved her the way that she needed to be loved? What if I spent those 18 years being loved the way that I needed to be loved, right? Now, granted, I wouldn't have the two kids that I have, so you have to take the, the, the good, the really good with, you know, that. But that's not an excuse. That's not, that's not the way to get to where we need to be. That they're not gay. You know, you mentioned that earlier. You know, because they're not gay, they don't understand. I have a trans niece. I don't, I don't understand the trans experience. I, I truly don't. But I sure try to be as empathetic and understanding as I can be. I love my niece with all of my heart. I'm one of the best people in, in this world. And, and if you look at the life she had up to that point, it was the idyllic Mormon life. Why would you give that up? Why would you make a choice 
to give that up unless that truly is something you are. So as much as I don't understand the trans experience, I have to understand people un- understand the gay experience. So that's why I need I need my story out there too for those leaders to understand, look, it doesn't, again, I'm probably the straightest gay man <laughs> out there. And if it didn't work for me, it's not going to work for anybody else. Given your experience with your parents, both mother and father, uh, through the mission, being isolated or left alone at the airport on your own, those feelings of inadequacy that you grew up with, knowing that um, life, you just talked about life being different, wasting all that bandwidth, life would have been so much different had people like your wife not spent so much time in a relationship that um, was contrary to the way it should have been. Knowing all of that and knowing the experiences that you had with your parents, and now you're a dad, what advice do you give to parents out there who may also have queer children and also a love for the gospel? So much so, especially within Mormonism, that it's difficult to separate the gospel of Jesus Christ from the family structure, that it's more important to support prophets and policy and doctrine and the celestial kingdom than it is your children. What advice do you have for them? It's the same advice I give to myself. What does your heart tell you to do? Put the, put the doctrine and the, the policies and the procedures, put them away. I, I had memorized the church handbook one, right? I knew that inside and out because that, that was my job in the church. And I'd say just, you've got to throw those policies and procedures out and, and love your kids, love them with all of your heart because the time you have with them is number one, short. And number two, they need it. They need it more than, than you, than they need breath. I needed it. And I never, I wouldn't say never got it, but I just, it was always conditional. There was always, you know, a string tied to, to, to that. And how much better my life would have been, I, I wouldn't say better, but how much quicker I could have got started with my life. It's a great way of putting that. Because I feel like now at you know, my age, I'm starting just to get my life going. And you know, now, now old age is starting to kick in. I, I have to put readers on. I mean, what the, who, who signed up for that? But this life is to be loved and, and, and enjoyed. Men are that they might have joy. And if you're standing in the way of anybody's joy, that's that's scary. But And if you can't love your kids that way, find somebody who can. There's mama dragons. There's other places out there. If you can't love your kids that way, then don't be their parent. Get somebody else in who can. I want to touch on one last topic, and you brought it up, um, interestingly enough, about uh, not having the resources uh, and the ability to date as these young Latter-day Saints experience, plenty of opportunities to have um, opposite gender experiences, stake dances, ward activities, opportunities. But it led me to wonder about resources. For gay men in your situation who find themselves in mixed orientation marriages, not sure if they can come out, like you and I both searching for other men who are like us, active Latter-day Saints, entrenched in the gospel, married to women, have, have children, what resources are out there? Where do you direct people? Now that you're on the other side of the aisle, what advice do you offer someone who was Joel eight years ago, 10 years ago? So that's a tough thing. You know, I, I work from home when I'm not traveling. And uh, so I, I truly work from home. I don't, I don't go out and socialize much. So, you know, I don't do bars. I don't do that. Not, not that, not that there's anything wrong with it. I know plenty of people who go to bars, <laughs> but you know, understanding that that just wasn't me. So for me, it was getting the right apps, you know. And I met John off of Tinder, and um, but you know, that I limited myself to the apps that I felt comfortable with, right? And for me, that was eHarmony, which is still very <laughs> whatever they are, um, you know, Tinder and 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 hinge and those type of things. I never got onto scruff or to, to grinder, or, you know, I know about them, but, but you need to be on what you feel comfortable with, right? If you are comfortable with that, if that's what, where you want to be, allow yourself to date and to, to expand your, yourself into those things. But 
understand that there are older guys, you know, they're, I mean, I know Facebook is old, but I don't get on it very much, but reach out to somebody on Facebook. There are, you know, there are, I mean, that's how we met was through a Facebook page Yeah, is, is, is understanding that there are things out there that we can't, you can engage with, um, but create your community. And I want to plug um, something you brought up earlier in the episode, and that is the affirmation, yeah. um, which the affirmation has chapters all over the world for uh, queer Latter-day Saints or Latter-day Saint adjacent people to experience community and finding birds of a feather and giving them an opportunity to um, share their experiences in private concealed Facebook groups that aren't public. So you have those opportunities to be able to um, kind of walk through the door, cross the threshold. And there's a lot that doesn't have to be said because you're among people who share the very same experiences. And for me, that was, it was a good opportunity to get rid of a lot of shame, knowing that every other man uh, in these groups were in a similar situation as I was um, when I joined the Fathers and Affirmation group. And you admin a Las Vegas group for people in, in the Las Vegas area and activities and opportunities to talk and just vent and, and to reach out. Just earlier off camera, we talked about Candle of the Lord, a talk that was written by Boyd K. Packer. But um, this opportunity to take a few steps into the darkness to find that the way is lighted ahead. That's what an online resource like Affirmation can do. And it sounds like it's done some good for you as well. Absolutely. I, I, I credit affirmation with a lot of my being able to accept who I, reading other people's stories and maybe not a hundred percent aligning with them, but saying, okay, they did that. You know, I, I remember the first time I went out on in a public with, with another guy, I've been told, oh, you'll just the shame you'll feel. And I felt free. I felt excited get into those type of groups where you feel that right get into those type of groups where they share your interests if you're a gamer do the the gamer stuff or if you're whatever there's different groups that you can find to to align with but reach out to you know reach out to us old guys and you know i i blame myself but i didn't reach out to a lot because i didn't want people to think i was looking for a, a so i was truly just looking for friends and this is kind of a, a weird, being gay is kind of weird because a guy is looking for a guy. For, I mean, it's like a guy going to, a, you know, a woman saying, I want, I just want to be your friend. <laughs> doesn't happen very often, but it does happen more often than in the gay world. So, but get yourself out there because hiding in your closet, <laughs> you're not going to find anything. But also understand that it is, it not only is the way, the way lit ahead a few steps, there's, there's a myriad of colors. It's not just a candle and, and it's not just rainbow. It's every color. And there's so much out there that, that you can experience. Just get it done. I love it. I love it. What haven't we talked about in this episode that you wanted to talk about? Um, anything that you really want the audience to know? Um, you know your spirituality better than anybody else. Don't listen to anybody else tell you what's right or what's wrong. You know what's right, you know, and you're going to be the one that's accountable for that at the end. Make the best of it. Beautiful. I love that. I, when Jay and I got married, I remember as I was writing my vows and thinking of the whole experience and my ex-wife sat in the front row of our, at our wedding with our kids. And, and I just looked over the whole experience and, and had a very similar reaction. Um, knowing that we had an am amicable divorce and it was because of her kindness towards me that I was able to even be in a situation like this, hosting a podcast, um, because I felt like she gave me strength to be able to share my story and help others along. But I remember vividly as I was kind of writing my vows or jotting them down and saying to myself, I got here and I didn't have to sacrifice any of my values and morals to get to this wedding day and to marry my husband. And it was a beautiful experience. And that's not something you've ever been told in your whole life, right? No. You were told that you would have to sacrifice absolutely everything and, and you would be in the depths of despair and unhappiness. And no yet, spiritual experiences, no joy ever again. I had a spiritual experience on the way, on the way up here, you know, watching a, I think I told you, you know, an eagle catch a, you know, fish in its it talons and just, just watching that and thinking, wow, this is, this earth is so diverse, so rich, so full, 
you know, if we put our blinders on, you know, the, the spiritual, you know, the religious blinders and only look ahead, you know, it's like the guy going on the cruise ship and, o- and only eating the, mu- the food he brought instead of realizing that there's so much more to eat out there. And the point of that parable was to live uh, to the fullest measure of your creation. Absolutely. And this is how you were created. Go to thy faith have made thee whole. Joel, thank you. Thank you. I, you're doing something that is helpful beyond measure. And, and I think, you know, to bring the Book of Mormon scripture and, you know, Ether, when it says, if you bring and save one soul unto, unto Christ, how, how great shall be your joy. I wonder how many souls you've been able to, to bring to their own fruition and their own fulfillment and full measure. So thank you. All right, um, audience, thank you for giving us uh, a little bit of time, uh, a little bit more than our typical hour, which is always the case, which is <laughs> always fun, that um, we can share experiences and stories and help build bigger and stronger bridges between these communities. Uh, Joel, you're on social media, a little bit on Facebook. If someone has a question for you, how do they get a hold of you, or are you willing to answer some questions? Absolutely, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll give you a, a link to my Instagram. I just got on Instagram, so you know I'm not I'm not as old as as everybody thinks I am. But I'll, I'll give you a link, and you can post that in the in the comments. Perfect. So welcome to the big wide world of Instagram. <laughs> Good gravy. <laughs> And for those of you who are watching on the video version, we invite you to share your comments as well uh, on Facebook or on YouTube. And uh, the audio version, we definitely invite you to subscribe to this channel where you can find episodes like this and others to help you uh, better understand the LGBTQ experience. But again, thank you. Thank you to our audience who are both listening and watching and participating in this episode. Know that you... um, are not alone, you're not broken, and that your best days are ahead, that this is an opportunity for you to live, as we've discussed in this episode, the fullest measure of your creation. It's stories like yours, it's stories like Joel's, and it's story like, stories like mine that help us each continue writing our own latter gay story. <laughs>